Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started today. We're taking a look, we're, we're still we're looking at the nervous system and we're going to get into uh, the synapse, the uh, chemical synapse from neuron to neuron today and what can happen. Anybody have any questions on anything before I start? Okay, in that case, I'm going to go ahead and get into this. And this is probably a good place uh, to pick up from. Let me close this off and get you there. Okay, now. When we use a neurotransmitter at a synaptic cleft, because you know, you know what happens, you know that an action potential comes down an axon, gets to the axon terminal, it causes the axon terminal to release a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter drifts across the synaptic cleft, lands on the postsynaptic neuron. You know, that's the downstream neuron. We're talking, you know, a, 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 an upstream neuron called the presynaptic neuron. We have the synapse, and then we have the postsynaptic neuron. Now, what will happen here at the synapse is we create a graded potential. The neurotransmitter drifts across from the axon terminal across the synaptic cleft. There's a little bit of a time delay there. It's designed that way. Lands on the postsynaptic side, opens up gated channels, chemically gated channels, ligand channels, and the neurotransmitter does one of two things. It either lets sodium come in and depolarize the, the postsynaptic neuron, usually at a dendrite, or it allows potassium to leave. And instead of depolarizing the dendrite, it hyperpolarizes it, drives it further away from threshold. So we have two responses that can occur at, at a synapse. We can have a depolarization event, or we can have a hyperpolarization event. One we call the excitatory postsynaptic potential, where we change the charge on the dendrite, because that's what the end of the, there is the postsynaptic neuron is gonna be using as dendrites to catch that neurotransmitter. And so what's gonna happen is we can have, we can be excited we can open up sodium channels. We can generate a graded potential and maybe get the threshold. You probably expect to get the threshold if it's neuron to neuron. Or we can have an inhibitory response. We can be pushed further away from threshold. So the, the EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential. So Postsynaptic potential can be excitatory or inhibitory. This is an excitatory one. It's based on a localized depolarization of the postsynaptic neuron, usually at the dendrite. We haven't got the threshold yet, but we are depolarizing the postsynaptic neuron. And the more neurotransmitter that we can release into the synaptic cleft, the closer we're going to get the threshold. You know, all we're doing here is generating graded potentials that, to, that may get us to threshold because that's all that's happening. The, the, the neurotransmitter is opening up, in this case, sodium channels. Sodium is coming into the downstream neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, causing a localized depolarization. If that depolarization can hit threshold at the axon hillock, we've got us an action potential. If not, we don't have anything except a localized depolarization event. The more neurotransmitters that we, that we can release into the synaptic cleft, the more the neurotransmitter that will allow sodium channels to open up, then the closer we're gonna to get to threshold. If we hit threshold, we have the action potential. So this is the excitatory postsynaptic potential. What kind of, what membrane potential are we gonna get in the downstream neuron. Okay. Mm 
Yeah. Um, we, um, that's interesting. Okay. So are we going to get threshold or are we going to get nothing? If we release an excitatory neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, we will open up sodium gates and we'll get a localized depolarization. If we get enough neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft, then to open up enough sodium gates, we will get, we will eventually reach threshold. The inhibitory side though is different. This is the inhibitory response. An inhibitory postsynaptic potential is gonna drive us further away from threshold. The normal charge in the membrane of a neuron is minus 70. Threshold's minus 55. If we're excitatory, we're gonna be opening up more sodium gates and depolarizing to get us closer to threshold. But if we are inhibitory, we are gonna open up potassium gates and potassium is gonna leave and we're gonna end up hyperpolarizing the postsynaptic side, the downstream neuron. And the charge in the membrane is gonna go not from minus 70 to minus 55, it's gonna go from minus 70 to minus 90 or higher, making it that much more difficult to get the threshold. So instead of seeing sodium come in, we're gonna see potassium go out. The neurotransmitter is going to open up the sodium, the, the, is going to open up the potassium gates, potassium leaves, and we become hyperpolarized and we get further away from threshold. So that's why it's inhibitory. We are much less likely to hit threshold when this particular neurotransmitter is, is being received. And sometimes it can be the same neurotransmitter, it just depends on the location. Acetylcholine, our old friend from skeletal muscle, is excitatory on skeletal muscle, but it is inhibitory on cardiac muscle. Same neurotransmitter, but it is two different responses. We drive ourselves further away. We drive the membrane charge on an inhibitory neurotransmitter, we drive it further away from threshold and we're less likely to hit threshold. So we can have a inhibitory response or we can have an excitatory response. It just depends on the neurotransmitter. It also depends on the receptors for the neurotransmitter. So excitatory, and inhibitory potentials. Here we see an excitatory potential gen being generated. We have a neurotransmitter that opens up sodium channels and sodium rushes in, and we get a localized depolarization event. This is a ligand gate right here. And so we're gonna generate an EPSP, an excitatory postsynaptic potential. So here comes the action potential down the presynaptic neuron. Calcium gates open, neurotransmitter gets released, lands on the postsynaptic side, sodium rushes in, and we get a localized depolarization, a graded potential that may get us to threshold or at least get us closer to threshold. That's an excitatory potential that we've generated. And if we can get the more neurotransmitter that we let in or that we generate, the more likely we are to trigger a depolarization event that will get us to threshold by hitting threshold at the axon hillock. And we, then we have an action potential. Here we see the inhibitory response. We're gonna have our action potential come down the presynaptic neuron. Sodium is going to be rushing in, depolarizing, depolarizing. Calcium gates are going to open up, triggering the release of the neurotransmitter across the synaptic cleft to land on the postsynaptic neuron. But here, instead of allowing sodium to come in, we're going to allow potassium to go out. 
And when potassium goes out, we're going to hyperpolarize and move further away from the threshold. We're going to go to minus 90 or greater, making it much harder to get the threshold. So we're hyperpolarized. So here goes the, here comes the action potential in the upstream neuron. There goes the neurotransmitter, lands on the downstream neuron, opening up potassium gates and potassium leaves. And the charge on the membrane goes from minus 70 to minus 90 or greater. We have become hyperpolarized. And it's that much more difficult to reach threshold. So now we got to get rid of that neurotransmitter. In either case, we got to get rid of the neurotransmitter. We got to use something to break it up. The old neurotransmitter can't stay there. See, if the old neurotransmitter stays there, it's blocking the receptor site for the ligand gate. And so we have to get rid of it. We can allow the neurotransmitter to diffuse away or we can use an enzyme like cholinesterase to break it down. That works in acetylcholine. Or we have the glial cells suck it up. Because remember, the glial cells are all around here, around the neurons. They can suck up the, the neurotransmitter and destroy it. But we can't leave the neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft because it won't allow. If, old, if the neurotransmitter is already there, it's already done its job. A second action potential coming down the presynaptic neuron and releasing neurotransmitter, it will that that new neurotransmitter will have no place to go. Because the, the postsynaptic neurons' gates have to be reset. They can't reset if the neurotransmitter is still stuck there. They have to be reset so we can do this over again. We got to get rid. We've got to get rid of the, the excess neurotransmitter. We've got to get rid of all the neurotransmitter. So, now, a couple of ways that we can improve the response. We have summation. You remember the summation dealing with muscles? You know, we bring in more and more muscle cells and we increase the stimulus, you know, so that we get a more powerful contraction because we're exposing more binding sites to uh, calcium and more and more troponin and tropomyosin are rolling out of the way. Remember all that from muscles. Well, summation here is simply what it sounds like. It is an additive effect. We can increase the amount of neurotransmitter being released from many axon terminals, or we can have rapid firing of one axon terminal to again, give you lots of neurotransfer. It doesn't say it's gonna be inhibitory or excitatory, but this is how, you know, whatever it is, what it is. Whatever we're gonna, the kind of response we're gonna get is based on how much neurotransmitter we're putting out there. So we have spatial summation where we have multiple axon terminals releasing the same neurotransmitter into the postsynaptic neuron. At what the synaptic cleft? That's this. So here we see one, two, three, four, five, six different axon terminals releasing uh, a neurotransmitter. It could be inhibitory, it could be excitatory. We don't know. But we do know that we're having, we're adding the effects of these, all these ne same neurotransmitters coming from the axon terminals to get our response. We're either gonna get closer to the threshold and hit threshold, or we're gonna go further away from the threshold. Now that's spatial because it is um, multiple locations uh, in space giving us this, this release. Now temporal is timing. With temporal, we release the neurotransmitters one act rapidly from the same terminal like this. We keep firing the uh, terminal uh, to release the neurotransmitter again and again and again. And so either we're going to be driving us further away from threshold or we're going to be driving us closer to threshold and we get an action potential.
This is temporal summation because it's based on time. One, one axon terminal firing rapidly. So <clears throat> with summation, you get three choices. You get three outcomes. <clears throat> you may release an off neurotransmitter and you can, it can be excitatory. You can, you can generate a graded potential that gets you to minus 56, but that doesn't give you an action potential. So you can have an excitatory res uh, response in the postsynaptic neuron. You've got a localized depolarization event that's brought you almost the threshold, but that's all it does. Because almost isn't going to help you. Almost gets you to minus 56. Does not get you to threshold. So that's one outcome. Didn't quite have enough neurotransmitter. Didn't quite open up enough gates. Close, but not enough. The second outcome is, yes, you hit threshold and you get an action potential. You generate the action potential because you, you were able to trigger threshold at the axon hillock. So it's the first response you were, you had a, a graded potential that got you almost there, but not enough. The second outcome is yes, you hit threshold. And the third outcome is you end up hyperpolarizing the motor, the other the motor plate, hyperpolarizing the postsynaptic neuron a, further away from threshold and nothing happens. So you have three, three outcomes. One gives you an action potential and the other two, does, other two don't. One gets you close to an action potential. The other one gets you hyperpolarized. So, okay, now. So let's talk about neurotransmitters. There's at least 50 to 60 different neurotransmitters. Now we know the most about acetylcholine. We've talked about acetylcholine. Acetylcholine has been studied by many, many people over the years. So we know an awful lot about it. Now we look at neurotransmitters two different ways. We look at them by structure and by function. Now, most neurons can generate at least two different types of neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters can have, some neurotransmitters are only excitatory, some are inhibitory, some are both, depending on where they're located. So let's look at them by structure and function. Now, acetylcholine is a small molecule neurotransmitter. It is released at the neuromuscular junction. It's excitatory at the neuromuscular junction. It's inhibitory in cardiac muscle. Uh, the peripheral nervous system, the parasympathetic side of the peripheral nervous system, acetylcholine is its neurotransmitter on the parasympathetic side. Even on the sympathetic side, the sympathetic nervous system uses acetylcholine as one of its neurotransmitters. So we use it a lot. It can be excitatory, it can be inhibitory. It's excitatory in skeletal muscle, it's inhibitory in many other places, including the heart. And it is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. So that we release that enzyme in our bodies to break down acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. Another type of neurotransmitter are the biogenic amines, catecholamines. Now, a, a simple uh, catecholamine that we're probably all familiar with is the chemical in onions that makes onions have that uh, delightful uh, odor that, that we find very pungent and irritating to our eyes. And we end up tearing up to wash the, our eyes out. That's caused by the catecholamines in there. A, Better known catecholamine is dopamine, a pleasure neurotransmitter. We release dopamine when we feel good, or rather we feel, we feel good when we release dopamine. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are also catecholamines. 
So these are three different types of neurotransmitters. They are three, three neurotransmitters all belong to the category of catecholamines. They're based off of amino acids. Another type of biogenic amine based off of amino acid neurotransmitter, serotonin. Serotonin is a mood stabilizer. It, it allows us to maintain when serotonin levels are normally being released in our central nervous system, then we feel relaxed. We don't feel stressed. We don't. Our mood is, you know, happy, or at least we feel good. Histamine is another neurotransmitter. Histamine responds to irritants, allergens, you know, pollen or peanut butter. It's all about scale. So we use all of these. Uh, we regulate our biological uh, responses with histamine. We regulate our emotional response with serotonin. Uh, our fight or flight response is controlled by epinephrine and norepinephrine. Dopamine is, is used in our bodies to make us feel good. Um, any imbalances in any of these catecholamines or indolamines usually occur during some form of mental illness like depression, for example. And depression and bipolar disorder are not character flaws. They are simply a chemical imbalance. That's all they are. They are a chemical imbalance that we can correct. It has nothing to do with, with strength of character or personality. So now other amino acids um, may be used as neurotransmitters, but you know, not all, we can't always tell that because you know proteins that are neurotransmitters are made up of amino acids. However, we know that there are four distinct neurotransmitters that are made up of four amino acids: glutamate, aspartate, glycine, and what's known as GABA. GABA. Those four are amino acids that function as neurotransmitters. We know that glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter and that GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. We also have what are known as the neuropeptides. The neuropeptides are amino acids that have a wide range of functions. For example, substance P, while we never stop receiving pain signals from our nociceptors, Substance P allows us to at least mediate the pain so that we can tolerate it better. We also produce something known as endorphins. Endorphins allow us to uh, reduce the perception of pain. It's still there. It just doesn't hurt as bad. It doesn't let us go. It doesn't let go of us, but uh, we're aware of it uh, a little less. So. And we have these gut brain peptides, somatostatin and cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin is what is released in the pancreas to trigger the um, discharge or the, the delivery of bile into the, uh, from the gallbladder into the, the uh, small intestine to chop up fat so we can process it. Cholecystokinin is the trigger for the release of bile. No. Other neurotransmitters, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, very important neurotransmitter in causing uh, vasodilation, blood vessels to dilate. We use uh, nitric oxide in memory, uh, in uh, allowing us to store and to create and store uh, new memories you know, in, 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 our, in our central nervous system. Now, neurotransmitters can act either by their effects or their actions. Effect-wise, they're going to be excitatory or inhibitory. 
They can be excitatory, meaning they can cause a localized depolarization event, or they can be inhibitory, driving us to the hyperpolarized membrane potential, like going from minus 70 to minus 90, and threshold still minus 55. Now, which neurotransmitters fall into excitatory versus inhibitory? GABA is an inhibitory. Glycine is inhibitory. Glutamate is excitatory. Acetylcholine is excitatory at the neuromuscular junction and inhibitory in cardiac muscle. Norepinephrine can be excitatory in smooth muscle and inhibitory in, uh, in norepinephrine is excitatory in smooth muscle around blood vessels, but may be inhibitory with smooth muscle around our airway. So we have an excitatory effect or an inhibitory effect. So what are the actions of this? Yeah, so we look at you know, uh, acetylcholine, excitatory at, in skeletal muscle, allowing us to have a muscle contraction. Inhibitory in the cardiac muscle, slowing our heart rate down. Those are the actions. Now, when we take these neurons, they don't operate independently. They operate in groups. We, our neurons are just not random uh, cells that are scattered throughout our brain uh, or our spinal cord. They work together in groups. And this gives us integration so that we are sharing information very quickly. It's much easier if we have hundreds of thousands of neurons doing the same thing at the same time for sharing information back and forth. It's much more efficient. So it's a much more rapid processing. We also organize our neurons into what we call pools of information, pools of neurons, so that we can receive clusters of information from other pools. And so we, as we pass information on from one location to another, we're getting it, we're receiving it from other clusters. So because 99% of what we do in our brain is association activities, we have to pull all this information together to always give us a comprehensive picture. You look at a clock. First of all, you have to know what a clock is. What's a clock? What are those things on the face of the clock? What's the face of the clock? Those are numbers. What are numbers? What do they mean? You know, what do the, what are those black structures on there? Those are the hands. What do the hands do? So when the hands move, they line up against the numbers. What are the numbers again? And then we, when we put it together, we have we we can tell the time by looking at the, the face of the clock. And yet, well, what does that mean? We still have to know what the time is and what the time means, and we have to count. And we're automatically calculating how much time is left in the class. So it is not just a look at the clock and tell what time it is. It is, we have to process all that. Now, we already know that that's a clock on the wall, but, it, but we still have to get that information out. So we use these, these pools of information to integrate, to give us a bigger, to give us the big picture instantly. You don't have to stop and look at the wall and say, well, what's a wall? What's a clock? You know, what do those numbers mean? So... Okay. Now, a neuro, neuronal or neuronal pool uh, can be as simple as one neuron leading to multiple uh, axon terminals connecting to other neurons. You know, several neurons can be a pool. We have two areas for the neurons. We have the discharge zone, discharge zone and the facilitated zone. The discharge zone is the neurons that are closest to the axon terminals. They're going to get, they're usually going to receive enough neurotransmitter to hit threshold. The further away you are from the uh, incoming axon, 
the less likely you are to hit threshold. Those are what we call the facilitated zone neurons. So depending on where our, pre our presynaptic neuron branches off, how many neurons are we gonna come in contact with? Are we gonna be able to have thre hit threshold or not? Now, the way we process information, we can do it one of two ways. We can, we can have serial processing, where we go from one neuron to the next neuron to the next neuron, giving us an all or nothing response. Spinal reflexes, where we have a sensory receptor, a sensory neuron, an interneuron, a motor neuron, and an effector, that is serial processing. One pathway, one pathway to get us there. It is not fast, but it's fast enough. It gives us an all or none response. The response with serial processing is always going to be the same. It's predictable. Ref spinal reflexes are predictable outputs. A reflex will give you the same response every time. Serial processing has one pathway and one pathway only. This is the serial processing pathway for a reflex arc. The receptor, the sensory neuron, the integration center, the, what we call the interneuron in the gray matter of the spinal cord, the motor neuron going out, and there's your effector, a gland, or an, another neuron, or a muscle cell to give us a response right there. This is a reflex arc, and this is serial processing. This step leads to this step, this step leads to that step, that step leads to this one, and this one leads to that. There's no branching off to go somewhere else. It's one step after another. Serial processing, one occurs after the other. But there's another way. It's called parallel processing. Think about serial processing for a second. You ever have Christmas lights where one bulb just breaks and the whole thing, the whole string of Christmas lights goes out? That is serial processing. You have two wires. And you, you have one, one set of wires in, in the strand and the circuit is complete by every ball being intact. As soon as you break a bulb, you break the circuit. And so that is a serial processing. Parallel processing is different. Parallel processing has multiple pathways. It isn't like a reflex arc where you have one leads to another and leads to another. It can only go one, one way, but it goes that way every time. Reflex arcs are great because it will always give you the same response, but parallel processing runs your signal in multiple directions and lets us associate other information. Our ability to process much more sophisticated information like what we're talking about right now to understand words and concepts that we're, we're trying to convey here involves parallel processing. You know, just using the example of the Christmas light is part of parallel processing. Even though the, 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 the uh, Christmas tree lights were not in, they, they were, I was using the Christmas tree lights as an example of serial processing, but you all probably had an image of a strand of Christmas lights. The ability to bring up that image of the Christmas light strand was because while I was talking about the lights going out, you had this mental image of, of, a, of a ball being broken. We've all probably been there. That's parallel processing where you bring in memories of other events on top of what you're trying to do. When you, for example, the example here is you detect an odor and it triggers a memory of some event or occurrence. Odors and memories are highly, are, 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 significant, are, are very, very linked together. Odors will trigger many emotional memories of events that have occurred throughout your lifetime. That is parallel processing, because not just the, the uh, 
sense the sense of smell, you detect an odor. You say, oh, that's whatever it is. You know, uh, it is methane gas. It is uh, roses. It is hydrangeas or hyacinths. Hyacinths are very, very, you know, uh, uh, pleasant smelling flower. And you smell a hyacinth and it, and all of a sudden it triggers a whole bunch of memories because of that odor or roses and it triggers a bunch of memories. Now, at the same time, you're, you're detecting the odor and saying, you know what it is? A oh, lot. That smells like bacon bread. That triggers another memory. Now we draw in an emotional response. So those are other pathways too. Parallel processing allows you to um, process information on multiple pathways at the same time and give you a much more comprehensive picture of what you're experiencing. Now, when we do this, using um, these connections, we tend to have four different pathways. We tend to have what are known as diverging circuits, converging circuits, reverberating circuits, and the parallel after discharge circuit. So this is a diverging circuit. One input leads to a lot of outputs. Skeletal muscles are controlled through diverging circuits. One nerve, one motor nerve controls many neurons, which control thousands of muscle cells. Because we got millions of muscle cells in, in our muscles. And so we have one neuron, one motor nerve, stimulating lots of neurons with lots of uh, uh, axon terminals. Remember, every axon, every motor nerve can control up to three, every neuron can control up to three or 400 muscle cells with three or 400 axon terminals. So you have a nerve controlling many neurons, controlling many, many uh, axon terminals. That is a diverging circuit. A converging circuit has lots of input. Perhaps you can, um, you have both an auditory and a visual and maybe a, an olfactory stimulant giving you the same memory. Here you have a, um, you see, for example, hyacinths, hyacinths, you know, a very popular spring flower, have a very distinctive odor. You see the, you see the flower and you smell the odor and suddenly you're thinking about uh, your grandma's house where she had lots of hyacinths planted around her in her yard. And that gives you, a, you know, and so you're thinking of the house, you're thinking of the yard, you're thinking of the, remember the odors, you're thinking of your grandma, you know, for good or for bad, whatever. All these, all of these inputs come together to give you one output. You're thinking of grandma's house. You're thinking of your grandma. You're thinking of hyacinths, whatever. You know, multiple inputs uh, to give you the same output. You're driving down the road. Somebody runs out in front of you. Uh, the light turns yellow. And uh, there's a police car right behind you. All three of these things, these inputs are going to tell you to put your brakes on. The same output or the same memory, what do I do now? I better put my brakes on. So, so diverging circuits spread the, spread the signal out you know, to other areas like skeletal muscle. Converging circuits bring everything together, multiple inputs to give you one memory or, or one piece of information, one output. So the reverberating circuit is one that we're usually not aware of. We have a feedback loop in here. Whenever we have events or activities in our bodies that we do over and over and over again, like our, our, our biological clock, falling asleep when it's dark, waking up when it's light, uh, walking. I mean, our biological clock does this every day, wakes us up, we, you know, we, we 
we get up, we go through the day, we fall asleep, we wake up again, we go through the day, we fall asleep, we wake up again, and go through the day. We breathe. Breathing is a reverberating circuit. We take a breath, and in about four seconds, we take another breath. And then we take another breath. We don't have to stop and think about it. Walking is a reverberating circuit because walking is a pretty complicated process if you, if you break it down into its individual components. We talked about this in muscles in lab about how when our foot goes down, our toes come up. And then when our toes go down, our heel goes up. The gastrocnemius pulls on the Achilles tendon, which pulls on the calcaneus, raising our heel and pushing our toes down. Our toes then spread out at the same time they're going down. So our foot dorsiflex down as, and at the same time as our heel comes up. And then we put our heel down and our toe comes up. So we are walking heel to toe, heel to toe, heel down, toe down, heel down, toe down. And yet, if we stop to think about it, we would probably fall down. But this is a reverberating circuit we don't have to think about as it happens. And then the last one is the parallel after discharge circuit. Multiple pathways give us a single outcome. This gives you that aha moment. You know, you're assembling something, you're following the instructions, the instructions don't seem to make any sense. And suddenly you, you, real, you, you look at the, the at the instructions and the structure one more time, and there is that breakthrough moment. It's like, oh, this is the wrong, they're telling me to use the wrong screw to put this clamp on. And then you have this breakthrough up and you go ahead and change it and it goes together. You're working on a problem in problem stats and you don't see it, you don't see it, you don't see it, and all of a sudden you see it. These parallel after discharge circuits work best when we're not actively thinking over a problem. If you're cutting the grass and your subconscious is churning over a problem, you're going along cutting the grass and all of a sudden, oh, that's how to do it. Or when you're asleep, many people report problem solving occurring while they're dreaming, they wake up, they write it down and they've got the answer where we have impulses traveling at different speeds, different, different, uh, different times coming through our pathways. And suddenly we have that light bulb moment. This is a parallel after discharge circuit. So, okay. And that is the end of chapter 11. Now let me get out of this. And uh, anybody have any questions on any of this? And I want to go ahead and start talking about the brain. Let me bring up uh, right. There it is, the brain and spinal cord. So let me go back here. And uh, okay, the brain and spinal cord. There we go. So the human brain, it will fit in the palm of your hand. It's not that big. It weighs about three pounds. It has a consistency of jello. Um, the male brain is slightly bigger by a couple, about 150 grams uh, than the female brain. The female brain has to do based on average skull size, uh, but the brains are essentially equivalent in size because since the statures, body statures are different, the brains are equivalent. There is no correlation with the brain between the size of the brain and intelligence. So bigger, bigger isn't better. There's no correlation between sex and intelligence. There's no correlation at all between any kind of uh, 
uh, race and intelligence. You know, brains are essentially equivalent in here uh, as far as structure goes. You know, the uh, average brain would um, show you right here. This, to give you an idea how big a brain is, this is a life-size model of a brain, and you can see I can hold it in my hand. Um, this is, yeah, this is this is uh, full size, no bigger than this. Yeah, so, the brain I'll show you this afternoon in lab is from a sheep. It's about one fourth of this size here. So, okay, so that is how big uh, a brain is. Let's go back to the discussion here. So now, now the brain, the human brain, is responsible for the ability to be irritated. That is sensations. You know, we have, that's a nice way of saying that we respond to stimulus, that we're irritated. You know, we're, our brain is irritable. It just means it responds. Our brain stores memories. We learn about things, we learn, we remember things, we put it in memory, and we also uh, can identify things. We also have emotional memories that are very pleasant, or maybe they're not so pleasant. Our brain is responsible for all of our decision-making activities, for good or for bad. And it dictates our behavior again, for good or for bad. It dictates our logical behavior and our emotional behavior. Sometimes our logical side wins, sometimes our emotional side wins. Sometimes we at least uh, split down the middle. So these are the, these are the five things that our brain and the cranial nerves, like you know, the optic nerve, for example, allow us to do. So parts of the brain. The largest structures of the brain are the cerebral hemispheres. So the cerebrum, where we store most of our information, as well as the outer covering of the cerebrum is called the cortex, and that is where we are located. Most of us are in this outer covering of the cerebrum. Then below that, we have the what's called the diencephalon, where we have the thalamus and the hypothalamus. The thalamus is this blue egg-shaped structure here. The thalamus is the relay station or the routing center for all sensory input, except odors. Odors go through the hypothalamus below that. The hypothalamus is the link between the chemical responses to stimulus and the neural responses, the stimulus. Back here, we have the cerebellum. The cerebellum is our uh, motor memory area where we refine all of our motor actions, where we, where we store the memories of how to do things like riding a bicycle or driving a car. And then the very last part of the brain is known as the brain stem, where we have some significant Re reflex centers here. It's also where we relay the, the spinal nerves up into the brain. So we have the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. The midbrain is this thing that's shaped like a bird. Use your imagination. This round, this oval-shaped bump is the pons. That's where many of the spinal nerves cross over. And down here is the medulla, where we have significant reflex centers on swallowing and on um, uh, heart rate and heart intensity and breathing rate and breathing intensity. So, yeah. so our brain is heavily protected. It sets inside the cranial cavity in the skull. We have an outer layer of bone with a layer of periosteum uh, on that bone. And then, then around the uh, inside lining of the, of the cranial cavity, we have what's known as the meninges. These are three layers of connective tissue which hold the brain in place. They also allow the brain to float in the cerebrospinal fluid. 
the meninges are attached to the cristagalli uh, there at the ethmoid bone, you know, right at, right in the middle of the cribriform plate and the perforated areas for the um, uh, olfactory nerves. So anyway, we have three layers of meninges. We have what's known as the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. The outer layer is the dura mater. It is the toughest and strongest layer. The arachnoid layer is the layer underneath the dura mater. And the pia mater is a very, very thin layer, essentially glued to the surface of the brain itself. So here we see, uh, there's our periosteum and our bone. There's the dura mater layer, the arachnoid layer here. All of our blood vessels uh, tend to be localized between the arachnoid layer and the pia layer here. So right in this area there. So as I said, the meninges, the, uh, the meninges are the dura mater, the pia mater, and the arachnoid layer the meninges. They cover the central nervous system. They protect the central nervous system. They surround the brain and spinal cord. They cover all the cavities in our brains. Our brains have lots of holes in them. They contain the cerebrospinal fluid. They help to separate the portions of the brain. They allow the brain to move around a little bit, but not move around a lot when it sloshes inside uh, the meninges. So our brain, it functions as a um, shock absorber. The meninges help to use the cerebrospinal fluid as a shock absorber to protect the brain from sudden movements. If the meninges become infected or inflamed, we call it meningitis. And you know, meningitis is a highly contagious bacterial version and uh, viral version of that. So now the blood supply to the brain has a problem. We have what's known as the blood brain barrier. Now the astrocytes wrap themselves around the capillaries and they form a tight junction. First of all, the capillaries are held together with tight junctions. And then the astrocytes wrap themselves around the capillaries, making it very difficult for certain uh, materials to leave the blood to go into the brain. Glucose has no problem. Sodium has no problem. Potassium has no problem. Oxygen has no problem. But antibiotics have a problem. Uh, viruses have no problem. Alcohol has no problem. Uh, so different things can get across this barrier and others can't. And that can create a, pro create a difficulty if we're trying to treat some sort of inflammation. Now here we see the blood brain barrier located in one of the uh, cavities in the brain. that are lined by ependymal cells. Ependymal cells generate cerebrospinal fluid. They circulate the cerebrospinal fluid. They are one of the glial cells. Now we have astrocytes wrapped around the capillary. So we can receive, we can give off oxygen and glucose. We can, get, we can uh, take up waste products, but we're pretty restricted. So waste products leave. Oxygen, and elect electrolytes and glucose can go into uh, the brain. Most other things are restricted. So we have the capillaries held together with tight junctions. We have the epithelial cells all held together with tight junctions. The astrocytes have wrapped themselves around the capillaries. So it makes it very difficult for things to get out that we don't want to get out. So how much spinal fluid do we have? Well, about five ounces. Now, that's not even a small drink size. It is salt water with lots of glucose, lots of potassium, lots of, of sodium, uh, albumin present in there. The three things that our cerebrospinal fluid does for us is allow the brain to float inside the skull, you know, as a function as a shock absorber of the brain 
cannot support its own weight. It would collapse on itself. So we let it float in the cranial cavity. Uh, also, every time we turn our head or we have a blow to the head, our brain is going to react according to the laws of physics. You know, and kind of slam up against the side of, of, the, of our skull and then bounce back. We don't like that. So we keep it floating. We keep our brain floating inside the, the sac of meninges. This is five ounces of fluid, it runs down the spinal cord too. We also make sure that we have more than adequate amounts of sodium and potassium to maintain the resting membrane potential of all the neurons in the central nervous system. So that we stay at minus 70 millivolts so we can depolarize or hyperpolarize as we need. And of course, we are we use the cerebrospinal fluid to get nutrients from the blood vessels to the actual cells of the neuron and to get waste products from the neurons back to the blood vessels. We have a fairly redundant circulatory pattern in the brain. We have what's known as uh, uh, we, we see the internal carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries going into the brain. And we form a structure known as the circle of Willis so that we can send blood around to the brain as we need. And by having this redundant supply, we're not dependent on just one location. We're damaged that one location shuts down everything. So we have a, a little, a lot of redundancy in our blood supply. So. Okay, so let's start out with the brain stem. The lowest, four, uh, the, the, the uh, lowest end of the brain. The brain stem is the, where we relay information from the spinal cord to the brain proper. The brain stem has significant reflex centers for us. It controls our breathing rate. It controls our ability to swallow. Remember the hypoglossal nerve? Well, this is where we're gonna talk about it. Remember the hypoglossal foramen on either side of the uh, uh, foramen magnum, a little tiny hole? Hypoglossal nerve is where the hypo hypoglossal nerve goes through there on the way down to the, to the mouth, to the tongue, uh, and to the teeth it allows us to swallow and chew. It goes up into the brainstem. We control our heart rate. We don't turn on the heart or turn off the heart, but we can control how fast we're going to beat. We control our blood pressure in the brainstem. We control our consciousness, how when we're awake and asleep uh, in here. The brainstem itself has three parts. It has the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Here's the midbrain up here. It's, it's at the top of the brainstem. Here we have the pons in the middle, and here we have the medulla oblongata uh, at the end of the brainstem. And somewhere the brainstem ends and becomes the spinal cord. So the end of the medulla is the beginning of the spinal cord. And it's sort of problematic because it just sort of runs together. You know, somewhere along there, we're, we are, we've reached the end of the medulla and the beginning of the spinal cord. Or if we look at it the other way, we reached the top end of the spinal cord and the beginning of the medulla. So it just sort of, as I said, it's, it's somewhat problematic. So the midbrain, the top of the brainstem, it's an inch long, sort of shaped like a bird. It's... Um, this structure right here, this is, this is the, uh, the midbrain. It has two parts to it. It has um, this part on, on, the, uh, on, on the, the ventral surface and the dorsal surface. You know, and there's a, there's a cavity in between called the fourth ventricle. So filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So let me go back here and tell you about this a little bit. Come on. There we go. One, two, get back. There we go. Now, 
The midbrain, behind the midbrain is that blue structure, or in the middle of the midbrain is that blue structure. That is the cerebral aqueduct. It's a passage for the cerebrospinal fluid. It connects the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. This is the fourth ventricle right here. This is the third ventricle up here. The, uh, it is found between the diencephalon, which is the thalamus and hypothalamus, which is the, this blue and purple structure. This is the diencephalon here. It's often referred to as the cap to the brainstem. That's the diencephalon. And the pons, this is the pons down here, this big green oval. So um, the, um, The midbrain looks like it's holding up the cerebral hemispheres. It really isn't, but it looks like it is. There are clusters of cell bodies scattered throughout the midbrain. And there's lots of white matter. White matter is always the myelinated tracts, the axons that have been myelinated. On the dorsal surface, there are four large bumps. You can see two of them here. There are two sets of, of upper bumps and two sets of lower bumps. We'll get to those in a second. On the dorsal midbrain, this is a very important center for us. So anyway, this is the midbrain. So there's the cerebral aqueduct right there. Our third ventricle surrounds the uh, thalamus. That's the thalamus right there, the big blue thing. And the fourth ventricle is right below the cerebellum. This is the cerebellum over here. So, now the midbrain has several key areas for us. We have what are known as the cerebral peduncles. And the cerebral peduncles are, you know, if we're looking at this in uh, cross section with this is the dorsal surface here, the cerebral peduncles are, are on the backside and they, they, as the structure goes, they look like they're holding up the cerebral hemispheres. They're not. We do, those are just areas of sensory and motor, you know, uh, a, a, a nerve, if it's a uh, spinal nerve or a cranial nerve, is always going to have a sensory side and a motor side. You, know, you don't have an isolated nerve, you're going to have a sensory and a motor side. Now, there are two key areas here of cell bodies. We have what's known as the substantia nigra. This is this dark area in here. It appears, it, it appears darker because it has a high melanin. The pigment melanin has a high melanin concentration. Melanin turns out to be the precursor molecule for the formation of dopamine. Dopamine, as I said earlier, is a, is a pleasure neurotransmitter, but it also is used to control muscle activity. The other area we see here where we have lots of cell bodies is what's known as the red nucleus. Here we have a lot of pigment that contains iron which gives it a red appearance as opposed to the, to the dark appearance of the uh, substantia nigra. Now, the, um, the red nucleus is used to help coordinate between the, co the cerebral cortex, the outer covering of the brain, and the cerebellum. So signals that go from the cortex to the cerebellum and from the cerebellum to the cortex have to pass through the uh, red nucleus and the red nucleus helps to put it all together so that we get a comprehensive signal instead of just sort of some sort of erratic signal. Now, the midbrain depends on a structure called the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia is deep inside the cerebral hemispheres. And the basal ganglia are not cell bodies. Because whenever we use the term ganglia, we're, 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 we're 
told to think of cell bodies because cell bodies in ganglia are cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. They're nuclei if they're in, in the central nervous system, but that's not the case here. I don't know why we use the term basal ganglia. That's the name that they've been given and we're stuck with the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are deep in the cerebral hemispheres. You can see where they're located. They, you know, for reference, there's our thalamus right there, and our basal ganglia is somewhere above the and around the, the thalamus. The basal ganglia allows us to plan motor activities. It allows us to look at something like a coffee cup or a drink or a, a burger, a sandwich, or anything that we are going to plan our movement. How, you know, we're going to drive a nail with a screwdriver. We're going to walk over to the door and open the door. We're going to pick up a cup and take a, a sip of whatever's in the cup. We plan that motion. We, and what we do is we, it allows us to stimulate the motor cell, the, the motor neurons and the muscle cells we need to do that motion and block any competing or antagonistic muscles from getting in the way. So we get a smooth fluid motion instead of some erratic bouncing around, bouncing off the desktop, bouncing off the table, our hand shaking as we go to unlock a door. We have, we block all the competing actions so we get one fluid action. This is what the basal ganglia does. The basal ganglia takes the instructions, go over and unlock your door. So you can pull your key out of your pocket, go over, stick the key in the lock, turn the key in the right direction, the door unlocks, and you can go in or go out or whatever you're doing. That's what the basal ganglia does. It takes a, it blocks all competing actions. So when we and when we plan to do something, it, it, the basal ganglia plans our action for us so that we don't have any uh, unintended consequences here, unintended actions getting in the way. We we make it a very efficient motion. That's why the basal ganglia is so important to us. The basal ganglia depends on the midbrain so it can do its job. You see the the basal ganglia are held in the basal ganglia <clears throat> will inhibit other actions. That's great. But we don't want them to inhibit too much. We don't want to block too much action. Now, the, the um, two areas that can help control this are the substantia nigra and the red nucleus. The, step, the substantia nigra has a lot of melanin present in there. Melanin is the precursor to dopamine. Dopamine is used not just as a pleasure neurotransmitter, as I said, but also to inhibit the basal ganglia so that it doesn't have excessive control. We don't want to have too much control from the basal ganglia. We want to have just enough so that when we plan an activity and you know, this planning of an activity is I'm going to go pick up my coffee cup and take a sip. You know, as fast as we think that, we're going to do it and we wanna do it as efficiently as possible. You don't wanna put your hand out and miss the cup or grab the cup and knock it down or grab the cup and crush it or try to bring it to your, to your mouth and end up throwing the coffee in your face. So we modify the actions of the basal ganglia so that while we have picked the most efficient method, we are using the dopamine to make sure we don't overdo it. And if we can't, if we don't have enough dopamine, we can't control the substantia, uh, control the basal ganglia. There is a condition known as Parkinson's disease. 
in Parkinson's disease, the substantia nigra doesn't make enough dopamine. And the basal ganglia can't be kept in check. The basal ganglia can't restrict inhi inhibitory movement. And so now with, with the basal ganglia running unchecked, your, your patient will develop tremors and shakes, uh, shakiness, difficulty in walking, swallowing, and talking. This is what happens to in, in cases of Parkinson's. Uh, the substantia nigra neurons can no longer produce melanin. Melanin is the precursor to dopamine. Dopamine controls the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia can't restrict uh, unintended actions anymore and because we don't, it, there's no dopamine there. And your patient shows all these symptoms. They have a tremor, they have the inability to move, they have a very rigid movement, uh, their face may be partially paralyzed, because what's happening here, it's all because more and more muscles are being stimulated. We have an increase in muscle tone. Remember what muscle tone is? Muscle tone is signals going out to various motor units to, to contract and then relax, and then another one contract and then relax. Well, in this case, they're not relaxing. And so we become more and more rigid. It's a progressive disorder. And the root cause is a lack of melanin, which leads to a lack of dopamine. Okay. Now on the dorsal side of the midbrain, we have four large protrusions, four bumps, if you will. They're called the corpora quadrigemina. They are reflex centers. The Two, the, the, the bumps are called the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. Superior colliculi are on top because it's what they're called superior. Inferior are down below. The superior colliculi is a reflex center for eye movement. Visual stimulation. For example, you turn your head in the direction of movement in your peripheral vision. That's a reflex controlled by the corporate quadrigemina. You are playing, you are catching, you know, someone throws something and throws a ball at you and you reach up your hand and catch it. That's a reflex action. Superior colliculus uh, does that for you. You can track motion. You're driving and you see a car pulling out or you're waiting at an intersection to pull out and you're watching the traffic and you are assessing how fast the cars are going. And when you have an opening that you can pull out. The inferior colliculus allows you to turn your head when you hear a sound. A loud noise causes you to turn your head in the direction of the sound. A bright light does the same thing. And that's a visual stimulus. Someone calls your name and you turn your head in the direction uh, of, of the sound. Yeah. Um, you know, some, um, someone beeps your horn while you're driving and you react to that. That is a auditory stimulus and the corporate quadrigemina is, uh, uh, will respond with it reflexively so that you can try to locate the source of the stimulus. So these are Two key, this is a very important reflex center for us on the dorsal side of the midbrain. So, okay, this is a great place to stop. And I will uh, wrap this up. This afternoon in lab, we're going to go over the parts of the ear, the eye, and the, the internal structures of the eye. And we're gonna take a look at the brain. So anybody have any questions about that? Okay, then I'm gonna get us out of here and I will see you all uh, in lab.